So here in chapter 29, we're dealing with magnetic fields that are due to currents, right, or, or moving charges. The last chapter, chapter 28, we just had magnetic fields in space, right, due to permanent magnets or some existing field, okay? Now we are actually having it arise out of thin air, so to speak, right? It's simply due to the fact that a charged particle is in motion. That gives us a magnetic field. So, whoops, if we have a straight line, try and make it as vertical as possible, we want to find the field at some point P in space, right? That's some distance from this wire, all right? And if this wire is an infinite wire, it has a current, let's say, running upwards on it, like that, that will create some magnetic field at point P, right? It'll create a slightly weaker field for points inside and slight, sorry, I said that backwards, a slightly weaker field for points away and a slightly stronger field for points closer to the actual um, moving charges, okay? So, let's see. We need to use the biot savart law. So, that tells us that the magnetic field will be equal to mu naught i over 4 pi times the integral of what's known as ds cross with r hat all over r squared. Oh man, that looks like a crazy wicked integral, right? But let me show you how it's not really that bad. So, on the right here, this wire is composed up of tiny length elements ds, right? And each of these have the same magnitude of current, right? The same rate of current flow, because this is a steady current. We're not dealing with time varying currents quite yet. And so if we have some, well, we'll say wire segments of length ds, each of them are different distances from point P, right? Let's say that one is capital R, this one is capital R prime, and the one above is, well, we'll say R double prime, okay? And so really the magnitude of the magnetic field at point P will be different depending upon those distances, but they all will contribute to the field at point P, okay? And this is why integration is so incredibly helpful, right? We can just say, well, let's take one wire length of ds, whatever that is, and we'll integrate all of those contributions across the entire length of the wire. What's the length of the wire? Well, it's infinity, right? Theoretically. So let's change up our diagram a little bit. And thus, we need to only use one ds. It's still not very vertical. Closer, good enough. So now at point P, okay? It's a distance r from the wire. And let's put our ds, well, let's say it's up here. Okay, infinite wire, infinite wire, and there's a current going up, okay? And so that ds, now we'll say it's a distance lowercase r, and that specific element is a distance lowercase r from point P, okay? And that's not the same as the point in question, point P, a distance from the wire itself. That's capital R. So now let's look back at the integral and start evaluating that, okay? So that ds vector has a magnitude, well, of ds. And in order to evaluate this integral, we have to evaluate the magnitude of that cross product. And so, that ds has a magnitude, ds. And r hat, what is the r hat vector? Well, that's always going to be the unit vector of the wire or the, the current that's creating the, the magnetic field to the point in question that we're trying to calculate. So in other words, it'll point like that, r hat, 
right? It's always from the wire or from the current source to wherever we're calculating, right? To the point in question. So evaluating the magnitude of the cross product, we have the magnitude of the first times the magnitude of the second. What's the magnitude of a unit vector? Well, that's just one. So I won't necessarily write that. And then we have to multiply by the sine of the angle between. Well, that's theta right, right there. Okay, and then we have 1 over r squared on the bottom. Can't forget our limits. Now it's time for some substitutions. Okay, let's say the sine of theta, hmm, looking at that diagram, it's not that intuitive. But if we say, well, what's the sine of that angle? That angle I'll call phi. And we can say sine of theta equals the sine of phi. Right? In other words, it's whatever the opposite is of that angle. So for theta, I mean, ostensibly, it's that same thing over there. Okay. So what is sine of phi? Well, it's opposite over hypotenuse. Simple. <coughs> Simple. What is lowercase r, though? Lowercase r we haven't quite defined yet. That is using Pythagorean theorem, since we've created a right triangle here, and really wherever this ds is, whether it's down here or whether it's way up here, you'll always have a right triangle. That is simply the length of both sides squared added together. Square root. And so I'll call that side length S, by the way. And so that is what we put in the denominator of this sine phi. And now I can take that whole expression and plug it in for sine theta, right, right there. So let's see what we have. We have mu naught i for pi. Uh, integral is still the same, 0 to infinity. Um, I'm going to wait to tack on ds to the end. So we have capital R all over that square root. And we still have this 1 over r squared on the bottom. And we just found out what r squared is. It's this. And so now that's our integral. S. Right? Combining this a little more concisely, we have mu naught i 4 pi integral 0 to infinity of r over that to the 3 halves ds. And so s is our variable of integration. r, remember, is a constant. Capital R is a constant. I'm going to need a little more room down here, so... Now, that looks like a fairly, you know, intense integration. You can do it with some u sub, but if you wanted to look up in an integral table, you can use the following format, right? The integral of 1 over something to the 3 halves power, which I'll use as an example a and x. This equals our variable on top times the constant times whatever was inside the 3 halves term. And that becomes a square root. So now using this and applying it to our problem, we have the following. We have the capital R that remains. And the a right here is on the bottom, the 1 over a squared. a, remember, is the same thing as capital R. So we just have 1 over capital R squared. And now we can plug in our integral answer. So we have s over r squared plus s squared square root, evaluated from 0 to infinity. Okay. 
And so, let's see, let's evaluate this. We have one, or sorry, mu naught i times four pi. Whoops, whoops. I think you all, you, you may have been screaming at the uh, computer screen. What have I forgotten to do, right? If you haven't noticed, pause now. Go back and try and find my mistake. It's a simple fix, but go back, back and try and find it, okay? What I forgot to do is the following. Since we're integrating this infinite wire from zero to infinity, I'm only taking into account half of this wire. So I need to multiply this whole thing by two. This whole thing by two times two. And that makes that makes my prefactor one over two. There we go. There we go. All right. Now we're now we're clicking. Okay. Integrating. We have to plug in infinity over r squared plus infinity squared, square root, minus, plugging in zero, okay. Um, don't tell your math teachers, but we can hand wave this. The first term here is infinity divided by square root of infinity squared. Well, that's basically the same thing as one. And the second term is zero over zero. It's, well, basically zero. Well, zero over r, I guess. That's zero. So what we have is mu naught i over two pi r. And that's our answer. That's the magnitude of the magnetic field. Which way does the field point? Well, at point P, remember, we have a current, and if you put your thumb in the direction of the current, I'm going to try and write a, a hand here. So, like that with your thumb, and you have finger, 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 and if you see, four fingers. Okay. If you put your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers will point, will curve in the direction of the magnetic field. So in other words, right, the field will point into the screen, right there. And then on the left side of this wire, it'll point out of the screen, okay? So that's the direction for the magnetic field at a point P to the right of an infinite wire with a current traveling up, right? That's for an infinite wire. Let's see, you can do the same thing for a semi-infinite, which is basically what I was doing by, by accident earlier. A semi-infinite wire is, well, just half of an infinite wire, right? Well, what we did for the infinite wire was multiply by two. If we did it for half of that, well, what do you think we need to do? We just divide by two, right? So for a semi-infinite wire, very similar to what I just did, except it's divided by two. So this is the case here, also into the page. All right, thanks for watching.